Hello and welcome to the Japan Zoominar at UC San Diego. I'm Ulrika Shader and I'm the director of JFIT, the Japan Forum for Innovation and Technology. Uh, this is at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UC San Diego. GPS is a mix of an international relations and a public policy school, and we also have a focus on the Pacific Rim. Uh, one of our, uh, our programs is the Masters of International Affairs, MIA, uh, and it has a Japan specialization. If you're interested in our programs, please go to gps.ucsd.edu. At GPS, we have a Japan Center, the Japan Forum for Innovation and Technology. We conduct research, we educate, we inform, and we try to build connections across the Pacific. If you're interested in our activities, uh, please look us up at jfit.ucsd.edu. I also have my own website where I post uh, current events. Uh, you can find it at thejapanologist.com. Our Zoominar, which is JFIT's uh, currently most uh, active activity, uh, is held every Tuesday at 4.30 p.m., uh, which is Wednesdays at 8.30 in Tokyo. Um, in case I lose you and you have to scoot before we're done, let me alert you of upcoming events. Next week, uh, John Treat, uh, Professor Emeritus at Yale University, he is one of the outstanding uh, contributors to our knowledge of Japanese literature, and he'll talk about uh, updates and what's going on in that area. Uh, followed by two weeks of talking about business and companies. Uh, on the September 22nd and 29th, we'll talk about Japanese business after Abe and Japanese global business. We'll then turn to um, Andrew and uh, uh, security. Uh, followed by Alice Krauss, who will also talk about uh, the what's at stake and security matters in the Pacific Rim. So that's all to say uh, this will continue. Stay tuned. We'll be here every week. You can find our recorded Zoominars at jfit.ucsd.edu slash Zoominar. And today it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Saori Katada. She is a professor of international relations at the University of Southern California. And to introduce her, let me stop my screen share so you can actually see her while I speak. There's uh, Katara Sensei. Uh, Saori was uh, born in Tokyo, uh, spent a year as an exchange student in Medford, Oregon um, a while ago. Uh, she earned her undergraduate degree at Shitatsubashi University, my alma mater as well. Uh, and then spent some time um, with, the, uh, as with the UNDP in Mexico City, earned her PhD in political science at UNC, and after that uh, moved and worked for the World Bank for two years. And that gained uh, or provided her a deep glimpse into what international organizations do and how to think about international trade and uh, trade negotiations. Uh, she joined the faculty at the University of Southern California in 1995 and uh, has been a professor uh, there since. She's been prolific. Uh, and you should really look at some of her books. Uh, she won an award, uh, the OER the, uh, Award for Banking on Stability, Japan Finance in the Region, uh, which is one of the areas that she really uh, is famous for. Uh, she has a book on taming Japan's deflation with, uh, I think that's the one with Jean, is that right? Uh, the one with Jean Park. And also a book on the BRICS and the collective financial statecraft. Uh, I invited Sori today because we just basically bought both wrote books that, uh, you know, you might have seen it in the uh, advertisements that go, that, that are like hand in glove. Uh, Saori's book is titled Japan's New Regional Reality, uh, and it is about the geoeconomic strategy of Japan in the Asia Pacific. And mine, of course, is about Japan's business reinvention. So, uh, Saori, before I give you the microphone, let me just frame this just a little bit of why these books go together so well. And by the way, they both appeared within, uh, in the bookshelves within four weeks. So same publication date, basically same time that we wrote about it. So, um, so, so the, the similarity or the, the starting point of both books is Japan's recent business transformation. So we used to think about Japan as what it was, an exporting nation. Uh, the, the, uh, Japan was, was thought of as a, was a country that had a lot of manufacturing within Japan that was then exported around the world. 
and uh, you know books have been written about the ethno ethnocentric management practices and so forth and so on. Uh, that changed with first the trade wars with the United States that forced Japanese companies to invest in other countries, uh, so FDI. Uh, and built a global manufacturing network. And then it changed again over the last two decades with uh, the rise of South Korea and Taiwan first as competitors in consumer end products. And then of course, the rise of China. So whereas my book is about the rise of China uh, and how Japanese companies reacted to that new reality, Saori's book is about how this business transformation and the rise of China and the rise of these other competitors have brought a shift in how Japanese foreign policy thinks about economic strategy. So what is needed for Japanese companies to be successful? And so I hope I didn't steal your thunder, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so you're looking at trade and economic policy. I'm looking at what Japanese companies are doing. And of course, the two go together, right? And so with that, uh, sorry, let me uh, invite you to take the microphone and tell us what your book is about and why we should all go buy it and read it and uh, <laughs> comment on it on Amazon. So thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you, Yurike. Uh, this is a great, great, great pleasure to be here. Uh, Yurike and I go back, way back. I guess we came to this area about the same time and we talked about the you know, connection at Hitotsubashi and, and so on. So it's been a great uh, honor to be here. And good morning and good morning to the people in Japan. I guess a good afternoon to people uh, and good evening people in West Coast, good evening to people in the East Coast. This is really a wonderful opportunity for me. Um, so my name is Haori Katara. I uh, work at University of Southern California, um, and uh, you know, this is kind of a really wonderful way to connect with people in this pandemic era. So I and I appreciate it. So uh, Eureka and I've been working on this. You know, have finished these two books. What happened to Japan while we are not looking? And mine is you know, kind of a part two. And this is exactly uh, the transformation of Japan, but looking from mostly uh, from the government side. So let me start with the PowerPoint, if you don't mind. And I will try to make sure that I leave time for uh, discussion Q&A. So I might go a little too quickly, but uh, bear with me. Uh, uh, so you know, again, uh, wonderful to be at the Japan webinar. Um, really interesting thing that's happening in the last few years is this, that when uh, the new incoming President Trump in January 2017 said no to TPP and TPP, which is the, the big mega free trade agreement across the Pacific with 12 countries, including Japan and United States, but not China, uh, kind of was about to really die in shame, even though they have already agreed and they have been, you know, all the 12 countries signed and so on, uh, came Japan and the rest of uh, 10 countries, so 11 altogether. And within a year, they concluded uh, TPP without the United States, with most of the agreement intact, with a few other few few uh, chapters being suspended, uh, and by May of uh, 2018, uh, sorry, March of 2018, they have actually agreed to sign it. So um, the main, you know, kind of a, a broadcast, the the headline altogether is that Japan, you know, when Japan now kind of really become the savior of this uh, liberal order that's creating and you know, underpinning the regional uh, free trade, regional um, rule setting and so on and so forth. One thing that's very important for uh, about TPP is that this is a really high standard trade and investment agreement. Not only it is you know, huge in terms of size, it captures about 40% of the, the world GDP, so countries combined, um, while you know it also has a high standard rules which are not only trade uh, the border across the border liberalization of tariffs but also things like e-commerce rules on e-commerce a uh, protection of intellectual property rights uh restrictions or, or kind of control over the the state-owned enterprises and so on and so forth so this is a kind of a gold or even platinum standard uh, rule setting device for the Asia-Pacific trade and investment relationship. 
So the fact, you know, this cap, I think this uh, uh, headline captures really nicely about Japan, the fact that Japan, which used to be the trade villain, uh, I think you, you already told about this, uh, US-Japan trade tensions in the 1980s into 1990s, uh, is now uh, becoming the, the hero of the trade and investment kind of arrangement across the, across the region is really a, a kind of a groundbreaking breaking, uh, event. And this really gave me a very good platform to talk about my book. And this is a plug that this just came out in July uh, from Columbia University Press. And, and by the way, there is a discount. So I'll show this again at the end of the, end of the talk. But um, because it looks at Japan's transformation, not only about this TPP to CPTPP kind of uh, dynamics, but going back about, about a quarter of a century, about 20 years, as to say, how, what, what happened, what changed? You know, for young people, maybe, you know, maybe it was a time that they didn't notice Japan. That Japan that there's nothing happening in Japan. You know, Japan was really out of any kind of headline for quite a while. But for the older generation, it's like, again, what happened to Japan? Japan used to be the protectionist and the one that really uh, didn't abide by the trade rules or, or you know, kind of uh, really kind of uh, played unfairly especially from the American perspective, vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. to penetrate U.S. market and so on and so forth. So uh, hopefully in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, I could convince you that there has been a very significant transformation which took place in the last 25 years. Again, Eureka looks at from the business side, I look at from the kind of more policy side, the politics as well as the kind of economic and, and uh, you know, government structure. So the questions are here. You know how you know how uh, really Japan became the savior of this liberal economic order of setting rules and setting uh, norms in in Asia Pacific, uh, in economy and trade and business and investment and so on, uh, and uh, how and why of you know this uh, Japanese geo strategy uh, geoeconomic strategy shifted over time about a quarter of a century I would say about 25 years. And I would like to conclude uh, what the kind of opportunities and challenges for Japanese government uh, for this new economic strategy. Um, I think it's a really interesting time too, even though my book came out at, you know, before, co well, my book's copy, ed copy editing finished before the COVID, so I didn't have anything to anything on the COVID, but ch changes in supply chains, again, you know, kind of intensifying US-China uh, tension would really give another interesting context to kind of think about the, the you know, role of Japan and the place of the, the Japanese geoeconomic strategy moving forward too. So my basic argument here in this book is that Japan's uh, government has made a so-called liberal turn uh, at the start of the uh, 21st century as the, the, that economy matured. And also, obviously, given the rise of China and shifting regional context, really created Japan a platform. Uh, Japan, uh, sorry, China US tension gave Japan a platform for Japan to push forward in rule setting uh, type of uh, strategy. And also, obviously, the reason behind that is the transformation of Japanese uh, political econ economic structure, uh, which really actually shapes particular strategies. Uh, within the overall kind of a broader geoeconomic, I'm sorry, particular policies in overall this uh, geoeconomic uh, strategy. So uh, first, let me talk a little bit, you know, defining what this geoeconomic strategy is about. So the geoeconomic, geoeconomics basically examines the use of use of economic instruments by the government in pursuit of national goals as they cultivate economic and political advantage to, for economic growth, competitiveness, and sustainability, and those things like that. So that's the way in which I see the geoeconomic strategy. And um, for Japan, the old strategy that it has taken, the Japanese government, has been quite uh, clear. And I've uh, noted some of the materials from that research in the past that they've taken a bilateral strategy dealing with China directly, dealing with the US obviously, and, and Southeast Asia countries and so on and so forth. It's been informal, it was informal, so no specific rules, you know, using negotiation as a basis, 
and it was uh, led by embedded mercantilism, which is the term that T.J. Penfell uses in his book, uh, where uh, it was the kind of a neo-mercantilism embedded in the domestic structure. While the new strategy, I call it state-led liberal strategy, uh, starting around late 1990s, is much more regionally oriented. So this is the kind of structural strategy, regionally oriented and institution building, building oriented. And engagement is much more formal, uh, legalistic, rule-based, and then so on and so forth. And also in terms of the va underlying values is the pursuit of liberal and global standards. So that's the, that's the big transformation, the shift I observe, and that's the center of my, you know, of my uh, book. Uh, I will just kind of introduce you only one chapter from that book. So I cover trade investment in chapter five, uh, money and finance in chapter six, and uh, uh, foreign aid and development in chapter seven. So, uh, you know, since I want you to read the book, I'll just introduce one chapter uh, uh, and, and maybe talk about others, uh, just kind of going through briefly. So the old style Japanese trade and investment uh, strategy was dominated by bilateralism dealing with the United States was clearly, and then dealing with the rest of East Asia that was kind of, again, uh, uh, working bilaterally on any channels and no formal agreement was pursued and then rule setting and kind of was not the part of the norm. Especially one can see that, yes, true that, you know, APEC started in 1989, but you can see in the so-called EVFL, uh, Early Voluntary Sectoral Liberalization Debacle of the late 1990, no, well, mid-1990s into late 1990s, Japan was still uh, objecting to some kind of a rule establishment kind of practice within the APEC. Japan was the minimalist when it comes to formal rules and kind of a concerted unilateralism was the way in which Japan pursued uh, using the APEC. While the new strategy of since then, so late 1990s, the real kind of cutting point where you can observe the basic change of Japanese government behavior towards the regional economic order. Now they have started to have first a bilateral, but later more multilateral regional institution, uh, sorry, the regional institution by uh, economic partnership, you know, establishing the economic partnership agreement. Uh, the first one was Japan was uh, the first one for Japan was with Singapore in 2002, and from there on it multiplied, which I will show in a minute. But these are all rule-based uh, structure, and that rules is not only for the trade rules, but for investment uh, included, and all of it will go beyond WTO. So most of the agreement kind of you know kind of uh, try to get to the WTO WTO plus, and that's clearly shown in the context of Japan's uh, joining TPP in 2013 and uh, serving saving uh, TPP and become you know, CPTPP and also its uh, agreement with Europe. So altogether, Japan's effort kind of paid off in this uh, diagram. Uh, this is from the METI's uh, white paper and I only could get the one from 2019. They haven't finished translating the 2021 yet. But I think the main, you know, it, the whole picture doesn't change much except for the RCEP, where it includes, I think if you look closely, it includes India, but at this point, India just kind of uh, uh, left RCEP, so it might reduce slightly in terms of the coverage of uh, EPA uh, of overall Japan's trade, but still, you know, more than 80% of Japanese traders, you know, would be once uh, RCEP kicks in, uh, would be covered by the uh, some kind of free trade agreement uh, going all across the, the world and you know, obviously very intensely so in the Asia Pacific. Really kind of a very, you know, very large shift because early, two, uh, by the year 2000, Japan didn't have any free trade agreement and Japan was one of the laggards. So compared to that, uh, this kind of achievement is quite significant. And again, you know, TPP, CPP really shows how serious Japan is about rule setting in the region. So I have uh, quickly, sorry, quickly. So money and finance, again, from the kind of my more bilateral dollar yen obsession to more regional standard setting. Uh, this is kind of a, uh, there are some uneven paths that it took, but still there's a, a kind of a path towards that new strategy. 
a foreign aid, um, I call it the kind of a hybrid pass, path because there were a few kind of mixed signals, especially maybe now it's interesting about this infrastructure competition between Japan and China and some like uh, Professor Sasada, Sasada from uh, Hokkaido University uh, published an uh, article last year about Japan being reverting back to the Japanese old ways. But I would say Japan is still uh, pursuing some high standard like quality inf infrastructure investment and becoming much uh, less of a kind of a kind of a mercantilist like unpaid aid and so on has been uh, you know phased phased quite uh, phased down. So these are the two other chapters looking at different issue areas. So the, now the question is why? What happened? What are the causes? And I look at both the systemic side as well as the kind of the domestic side, systemic meaning regional kind of global dynamics. Obviously, economic power shift is a clear foundation of the systemic side. You know, this is this just the GDP and it's a, on the, the market exchange rate level. So if you do it PPP, it will be a little different than China will be much bigger. But, you know, by 2010, as you know, Japan became the third largest economy, still significant size, of course, but uh, China overtook uh, Japan in that realm. But since China is now becoming, you know, becoming a competitor to the United States, what kind of gave Japan is that, what kind of gave, what kind of this produced was, it gave Japan a place to be, a, I would call pivotal state, that China, China, uh, U.S. kind of competition in terms of the rules and in terms of, you know, uh, kind of Washington consensus or neoliberalism versus the state-led capitalism, so on and so forth. You know, Japan really kind of hold the key as to which side would have the leverage in defining the, the regional order in the Asia Pacific. But also for Japan, and again, it's the kind of uh, shift to, you know, Japan has been increasingly integrated, and Eureka was talking about this, you know, Japan no longer is just a trading state or trading only state, it's now an investment state where integration into the regional production network and using East Asia as the the kind of production platform, including China as the part of production platform, and you know, is uh, really a key in transformation of the regional dynamics. And there, the you know, geoeconomic strategy becomes very important. So, um, so that's the, the regional side or, or kind of you know, geopolitics, geostrategic side. While there are a lot of transformation, again, while we are not looking, Japan changed quite a bit. Uh, first of all, obviously, the balance between private and public sector changed quite dramatically, where private sector's profit is now significant. And there is, has been some dis embedding of the private sector from the kind of government, uh, government role, you know, government uh, guide. So the typical developmental state, maybe that's a, you know, itself is a debate, but has kind of waned and uh, the arm's length relationship has become uh, the key. And obviously at the same time, and maybe promoting that even further is Japanese firms now increasing operating overseas, especially in, in Southeast Asia, China and various other places, but including places like Europe and the United States. So manufacturing, you know, almost kind of 60, 70% of manufacturing and more so for the processing uh, types are now producing outside of Japan, really making it important to have the rule-based regional environment where Japanese companies can really prevail, especially over the competitors, but you know, again, uh, looking at the, you know, China as a competitor there too. At the same time, kind of, uh, the, dom the, the political kind of structure has uh, transformed too. Uh, I didn't emphasize on it, but some difference in the way in which certain issue areas have different ways in which they take start to take the liberal uh, liberal strategy comes from some of the ways in which the policy making institutions are set up, but all in all, it's uh, you know suffice it to say that bureaucratic kind of uh, fragmentation was one of the kind of uh, key structure of Japan. So Niti does this, and then Mof does that, and you know Minister of Foreign Affairs, and and all that was one of the ways in which Japan was uh, characterized. While you know, starting in the mid 1990s, there has been a very strong kind of centralization of policy, economic, uh, foreign economic policy making in the hands of the 
the cabinet secretariat with the you know, major politicians. We have you know, kind of a strong role to play. Uh, there has been you know, changes in the, the electoral reform in 1994, administrative reform in 2001, and then uh, further on under Prime Minister Abe in the second term of the civil service uh, reform. All those kind of created more concentration of power within the government and be able to strategize. So TPP actually is a typical one where the you know, secretariat created a TPP headquarter to have a, a coordinated strategy to implement. So these are the ways you know, underlining structure that I outlined in chapter four to look at you know, the reason. I do have, so the, the, I would like to conclude with the implications of all this. Uh, obviously as a scholar, I have a lot of these uh, you know, kind of a, a IR jargon, international kind of a theory uh, contribution. But, you know, suffice it to say that, you know, there is a, a kind of a lot of interesting going on, looking at both the domestic and systemic uh, nexus. Maybe one thing that's, that's interesting for those who have watched Japan for an extended period of time is that, you know, Japan is now maturing, maturing, as a developmental state. And what happens to it is an interesting kind of uh, contribution that I can make from this book. Uh, also, uh, some competitive uh, uh, rule diffusion and kind of a way in which regional institutions are set up. You know, there is a lot of discussion about how, how diffusion, policy diffusion takes place. I think I have you know, a kind of interesting thing to say with this book on, on those debates. But anyway, the, at the last slide, is to talk about opportunities and uh, challenges for Japanese economic strategy, uh, geoeconomic policy, uh, geoeconomic strategy, is that now there's a very significant opportunity uh, with this rise of geoeconomic strategy or economic statecraft. And obviously institution, the Japanese institution is now set up even more so with the kind of a national economic council type of you know, kind of a, a, a division set up with, under the secretariat too. Um, and now, given the tension between China and the United States, Japan is now serving as the power, you know, using power of pivotal state. Uh, interesting to think, interesting to see how mature, you know, this mature developmental state is becoming a strategic actor. In some ways, I think it's interesting that Japan experienced being, you know, going through the catch-up process. No, no, um, not to go, violating some of the, the liberal trade rules in the past really gives Japan a uh, more, more, more toolkit to discuss it, not only with the US and advanced nations and more liberal states, but also the ones who are trying to catch up. I, I, I was told by the USTR uh, uh, staff when I was interviewing in Washington where, Japan joining TPP really made the TPP negotiation move smoothly because Japan could talk to Vietnam or Malaysia, places where they are still trying to catch up at, about the ways in which they can adjust to the high standard rules, having gone through their own experience. So in some ways, you know, that it really gives Japan a very significant advantage there too. Meanwhile, there are challenges. Obviously, uh, Japan's financial resources, the, the whole public debt is a concern. And still, even with the kind of efforts, efforts on the part of the, the cabinet secretariat and the prime minister and so on and so forth, some bureaucratic fragmentation still continues and that creates some you know, kind of a path dependence of slow going nego negotiations and, and policy formulations. Um, in some ways, I think the biggest part, which I would like to talk with uh, Yuriki about, is the, uh, the, the demise or dec dec decline of the Japanese government's control over the, the Japanese business behavior. In many ways, Japan used to really have a national project and going all, all, all Japan all at, all at once. But now, you know, kind of even very uh, prominently observed in the public, private public, public-private uh, partnership, PPP, that Japanese government really wants the private sector to come in for infrastructure investment and so on, but unless they, the private sector really see benefit in it, Japanese government really cannot force that. So in some ways, what they can do, the government can do, is to create incentives. So that's the you know, kind of things that you can 
see in the supply chain shifting discussion that's ongoing in the last few, you know, last yeah, few months, that Japanese government is create, you know, trying to create incentives that really cannot force the business to do things that they would not otherwise do. And finally, I would like to conclude with this, that um, you know, Japan still has this very ambivalent economic identity. There is a, a very significant part of Japan which still have the developing, developmentalist identity of catching up growth and you know, all that is important. While at the same time, now it's implementing many rules that are high standard, more liberal in nature, because that's how Japan want, Japanese government wants to define the regional economic interaction. And that's the kind of ambivalence that Japanese government and, and Japan overall, Japanese economy is, uh, is experiencing. So I would like to stop here, just you know, kind of uh, uh, end with another plug and say, you know, this is my book. You can go to Columbia uh, University Press's site to get 20% discount. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Katara Sensei. That was uh, terrific. A tour de force through the whole thing, including the theory. Uh, and, <laughs> and you covered it all. Um, so the, the audience is invited to type in Q&A. Um, I will try to weave your questions into uh, our conversation here. And indeed, we already have a few. Um, and I would like to start with, uh, you know, let, let, let's go to the one that you actually asked me about, which is, to what extent does government control or can government nudge Japanese businesses to play along? And I think that that is, you know, sort of a very interesting question what, because it's, it's obviously not played out like this, right? So the government knows what business needs and will try to find policies that actually help business because that's in everybody's interest. Mm -hmm. Business would be perfectly happy to help government unless it really runs against their own interests, right? So we should probably think of, we, we should definitely think of this as a, a give and take process where there's a lot of negotiation and by the time something is formulated, it really reflects the business interest. But the business interest, as you just said, is completely divided, right? It's almost polarized, where 20% of Japanese companies account for you know, the 2080 rule applies upon for maybe 80% of the activity. And then there are all these small companies and sm smaller companies and tiny companies. And, and then there are companies that are in the service sector and others in manufacturing and so forth. So there's a, a there, there's no, no longer one business voice. And I think that's the big difference that in the old days, right in the 1960s and 1970s, when it was all about exports, the, the, the country strategy was to export. And everything was geared towards the small companies were subcontractors and suppliers to the large companies and the large companies would, would put the stuff on ships and the trading companies would bring it to some other places and the government would make sure that all of this would work well and tariffs would be low and that sort of thing, right? And, and so it, it was probably much easier to formulate a, a strategy that now it's the business interest is much more diverse, much more variegated where Toyota wants one thing, and you know a supplier of toyota wants another thing and so I, I think part of this might actually be reflected so I'll, I'll put the ball back in your court i mean is that is that part of the explanation that if you can't represent one interest so if k Danman no longer stands for one thing then therefore the policy might also actually the the, the geoeconomic strategy might also be more about hedging your bases in all kinds of parts around the world and, and, and set up all of these different, almost uncountable uh, agreements with these other countries, right? So does that sound right? Yeah, I think that's, that explains, you know, obviously definite you know, big part of the picture, right? I think a good example is the free trade agreement. So Japan calls it EPA, right? Economic Partnership Agreement. And for a while, they could not, so the, the industries did not push for it because different firms have different profiles in certain countries, let's say you know, Thailand or Malaysia. So the, you know, the companies which already have invested you know, factories and so on in these countries actually don't want free trade agreement because they already established their you know, kind of a home advantage there. So they would not you know, push for it while those who are trying to export there would have. You know, things like that was clearly uh, demonstrated by the fact that you know firms have very diverse interests, even within the different you know, within the same industry, 
just different firms have different positions within the regional setting and that creates different voices. And even aggregating into the Kedanden level, I have a, a, a graph in my, uh, in my chapter four, I think, where you know, Kedanden actually could not agree on how to pressure the government because they, again, diversified interests. So they decided not to even uh, contribute to parties and, you know, and also the, the political side too. It was until 1993, it was okay, just go with the LDP. Well, once the LDP could, no, there was a prospect that LDP could lose between the majority party, even at no, this short period of time, a year and then three years, this created much more conundrum for, for them. So not only they have diversified the interest now, but the politics has become a bit more uncertain and that created, you know, created that, the, that kind of tension too. So yes, I agree with that. But at the same time, now the companies in many ways don't need the government's help in the same way that it used to need government's help. So they're not going, you know, so the only the ones that kind of cling to the government are the ones which are either, you know, not very competitive or being, you know, uh, have some certain issues. And that's, you know, that's not the same kind of Japanese strategy Know, that would not be able to kind of establish a uniform Japanese strategy in the same way. And also, you know, Japan it, it want to be engaging in some more offensive strategy rather than just a defensive strategy. So in order to have that offensive strategy, it's much more you know, catering to the ones which has much longer prospect and you know, doing very well in, in age and you know, market and so on and so forth. So you know, that all create much more difficulty in having the hands in, you know, hand, hand, hand in hand kind of a, a strategy for the government. It, it reminds me of a, a great conversation I had with a, a dear friend who used to work at the Ministry of Economic Trade and Industry. And this was something like 1995, a long time ago. And um, uh, Meti wasn't really doing much. There were new programs about, you know, energy conservation and recycle programs, but that wasn't the same as the old Meti, right? So I had dinner with him and I said, so what's your biggest problem right now? 1995, he said, mm, he passed a little bit, you know, sort of I thought it's going to be a long answer. And he looked, looked up and he said, Toyota. <laughs> and I said, why is Toyota a problem? And he said, well, it's obviously not a problem. Toyota is not a problem, but we have no longer control over them. We've completely lost our our input in their strategy making, right? And so, so that and that's twenty five years ago. So you can, you know, fast forward. So Tetsuro has a very interesting question that ties right into this. So let me uh, try to to ask it on his behalf. He says, "Well, what you what you describe here is a very long term strategy." Mm -hmm. But who sets the strategy? And he points out that politicians come and go. You just mentioned parties come and go. The bureaucracy used to be the the rock in the you know in the that that could be steady in its in its position on things. But but so how do you how do you match this the fact that politicians actually go? And in particular, there was a time when many of these agreements were cast, where Japan had a had a prime minister a year or something, right? So, so how, why, how does this gel into a long-term strategy given the fluctuations in, in government? No, that's that's a, a very good question. I, you know, in some ways, I tend to be more institutionalist in, in, in my orientation. I look at the institutions and the structure to think about you know, the direction and that's why you know, reforms of you know, administrative reform and so on are very important. But it actually does take uh, how do we, policy entrepreneurs within most of the time in still in bureaucracies they are looking at kind of a big vision about Japan moving forward and that being heard by leaders who can you know, political leaders so politicians who can stay long term supported by the institution that that's being you know kind of formulating into more uh, centralized form so obviously you know Prime Minister Abe was the we will, is still, I guess he has a week to probably to go. Uh, is the the perfect storm in that sense, right? So he he was you no, know, he lasted you no, know, he stayed a long time. He had the whole institution under his belt, and there are quite a few uh, policy entrepreneurs who are pushing these kind of policy upwards to 
to be heard. Um, I think one example is that you know, this rule making and, and rule setting became an important part of METI strategy uh, way, you know, kind of for a, for a while now. Uh, um, a, the, you know, there are, uh, you know, that kind of initiative starting back, I can't remember exactly, like maybe early 2000s. And, uh, you know, so, so that type of um, thinking has been percolating in, you know, kind of strategizing within the region. And that's being captured by the Abe administration. No, obviously, it's not only the regional strategy that, you know, co you know that, that was, you know, picked up, you know, that was picked up not only because it was a regional strategy, but it has, you know, good domestic and economic implications. So I think it's the combination of the kind of bureaucratic power, you know, kind of brain power, I guess, and the you know kind of politician sense and longevity in many ways if they can kind of keep this forward so but you no know, but at the same time even at the time when you know politicians were kind of changing over time then fda and you know so on the negotiation and stuff like that were implemented in you know kind of relatively constantly so i usually i i tend to put emphasis on the kind of bureaucratic side executive side of the government as the force behind it. So we have a we have a question from a, a USC alum, Colin. Uh, he, he wants to know what triggered this entire shift. Oh, and by the way, Rodrigo just pointed out that Toyota even sets their own holiday schedule. <laughs> that's that's how independent they are. They don't do a holiday when the when it's the emperor's birthday. They do the holiday when Heijunka needs it, right? So, so so Colin uh, asked a little bit more about the background of what triggered this shift, right? Mm -hmm. So, and and I, I guess he wants to, to push us a little bit more to talk about the, the end of the developmental state. And, mm -hmm. and he mentioned this, the sort of the, the, the ambiguity of, you know, what's what's identity? Uh, so who's Japan? And I think I want to disagree, I want to take you on a little bit on that, because I think Japan's clearly graduated from the developmental state. I mean, not, it's not even transnational development. So I, mean, I understand you had a conference on that lately. I mean, the, 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 Japan is no longer a developing country. It has squarely caught up with the West. There is no more uh, development, right? It is now something else. And I'm, I'm trying to find a new adjective that, that would describe Japan, mm -hmm. but I really don't think development describes it. Right. Uh, that used to be Thomas Johnson's model of the, a, a, a company that's trying to catch up with the technology frontier that has been established by other countries. And in, in Japan's case, it was it happened to be the Western countries. Um, and so nowadays we have developmental states that are companies, the countries that are trying to catch up with the technological frontier that Japanese companies are establishing. Right. And so what I talk about in my book is that that having caught up with the technology frontier means that companies now have to contribute to pushing the envelope, right? To, to, to make breakthrough innovations into new materials, new areas, new products, new business models, new whatever. And that means there is no, nothing to copy. And because there's nothing to copy, we now need, I guess, uh, what you're saying, what you're telling us is we now need a different trade regime, which is not one where we can just sell, you know, hundreds of thousands of Toyota Corollas to a country, but rather where we can operate in an environment where there is intellectual property protection, where there is, you know, a respect for sort of, you know, intellectual property and ownership and property rights and that sort of thing and and where where um, Japanese companies can operate as uh, uh, as they need to which means a level playing field or something I, you know, I don't know so so how do you end that so if, if I challenge you the developmental state is history what would you say to that <laughs> yeah I think uh, you know I think you and I belong to you know Japan optimist and you know really you know Japan is changing and then kind of very uh, interesting and you know kind of aspiring way but i think there are, we have a little you know kind of somewhat of a, a difference where i still think that there are well either the mindset or the kind of ways in which they they the the japanese economy you know japanese government you know maybe to some extent some industries 
think about developmentalism, like a growth you know, model to be, you know, kind of to some extent, the cap, well, catch up, not necessarily technology ways, but, you know, kind of, uh, you know, market share, or you know, some of these kind of uh, uh, old target that, you know, that's still being, being pursued. So I think there is still something there, but I, you know, that's my like 30% of me saying that still exists. And I think institutions change very slowly too. While I agree with you that, you know, again, companies have already, you know, many of the cutting edge industries have already gone beyond that, past that. So that's why, you know, Japanese government is in some ways following not direct lead, but the, the environment that it, it observes to have that rule setting and stuff like that. So, you know, I, but at the same time, I, I think in some ways that old self dies hard in a complete manner. So that's why, and you know, that's the chapter, what is it, chapter seven or chapter, yeah, chapter seven, where I was looking at infrastructure. So maybe, you know, it's different in the kind of investment, you know, private sector side, but infrastructure and the things like that, there is kind of a reminiscence of how government can play a role in, you know, kind of engaging with that type of sector. So, you know, it, it, it I, I agree with you about 70%. You know, there's this kind of 30% saying it's still, it's still not completely, completely liberal state. That's interesting. So, well, I, we have a ton of questions around where that's going, but there's also another set of questions that's, that's not about the internal, but obviously the Asia situation, since mm -hmm. that's the title of your book, right? So let's go, uh, let's go into Asia a little bit. Um, so you talk about the pivotal state and you've shown data that show that Japan accounts for maybe a quarter of East Asian GDP. At this point. Mm -hmm. uh, something like that. And yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so there we have a set of questions on the rise of China mm -hmm. and that's obviously the big deal, right? But there's also sort of Korea, you know, that's a big competitor um, and, and Southeast Asia. And, and so people are interested in hearing you talk a little bit more about this trade-off between just rule-based and, you know, this is, uh, the, maybe there's some history there or there's a, some fear uh, about China, you know, do, Japan and China, do they like to trade it with each other? I, I think they do because money rules and, and so there's history and politics and all of that. But when it comes to markets, you know, let's be friends. But but how does how do you parse all of that out? So what does what does the changing trade uh, situation in Asia, what does that mean for Japan? Is that a good thing? Is it a threat? Is it something for Japan to exploit? Uh, is, is Japan the winner here in, in, in all of this? Or, or was it, was, what's the What's the reality of the of the trade flows and the trade concerns? Of like the COVID Japan. in the, the recent years, um, I think overall, you know, Japan is looking at two sides of this when it comes to China, right? So China as on its own as a big market, that's one and China as a platform for a lot of the production that's going on, that's two. So I think when it comes to Japan-China relations, uh, Japan wants China to, so overall this rule setting, and obviously this rule setting, you know, Korea, you know, Korea or Taiwan or you know, many countries around it, whether they will be you know, part of the TPP or not. I mean, they are not at this point, but you know, whether they could even further on come on or not, any kind of rule setting of the one that Japan is pursuing or TPP you know, has pursued would be beneficial for us more advanced nations like Japan and Korea. While the target is you no, know, obviously countries like China or Vietnam or you know, various countries that is trying to set up these intellectual property rules and then so on and so forth that would protect the investment that advanced nations would have in using you know, their regional production network and so on and so forth. So ha having said that, you know, that kind of um, overall tendency, you know, Japan's strategy vis-a-vis -vis China is to make sure, that, you know, make sure that regional rule setting in such a way that China has you know, not much of a choice but to 
comply gradually and maybe you know a la carte format all these rules that would benefit the investors in, in, in you know in this region so whether that's investor as china producing for china's market or investor as producing for the global market through china that's that's same for japan to really needing this kind of rule-based environment you know kind of protecting their investment in, in in this region overall especially china so um that's that's the kind of overall picture i see um you know so us you know us china decoupling is also kind of mixed for japan right so yes true you know japan might be able to be the one that can that can connect these two even if they are trying to decouple on one side so that's the kind of role that japan would like to play and that will be its advantage one side on the other side you know and that's still that's quite obvious in the last few months maybe under COVID and stuff like that and especially when it comes to economic statecraft that's kind of being discussed around with the g5 and 5g and various other developments that japan wants to really kind of kick start where they are delaying like you know we talked about nec you know capturing uh, the contract from uh, uk and stuff like that where this might be opportunity for certain sectors that can kind of what do you call it, jump start or come into competition a bit with uh, uh, kind of ad added footing so that that's where japan's strategic position you know kind of fits so so this is an interesting question for mark uh, he, he asked, so, so with the U.S. becoming a little bit, shall we say, unreliable <laughs> um, and China being like this big player and this flexing its muscle and the big ships in the South China Sea, are there other players in the world, Mark wants to know, that are Japan's friends, that are, that are interested in protecting Japan's interests? outside the United States. So, so the, the historically it's always been Japan has been the ally of the United States and you know that was part of the trade regime, so it was all great. If, if the US becomes um, you know, sort of no longer as, as, as important in all of this, are there other allies around the world in, in the trade realm for Japan? Yeah, so obviously US is still very important for Japan. And again, even if I'm only focusing on the economic side, it is. But when it comes to the sea lanes and everything that has to do with economics, yes, I mean, you know, the kind of security areas that has to do with economics, US is critical. So that that that's that said, you know, if you know, especially focusing on the economic environment and rule setting, things like that. Obviously, for Japan, Australia, New Zealand are critical allies. So, you know, TPP too, even, even when it comes to CPTPP, New Zealand was the one that was really pushing for it. You know, again, coming back to APEC in the past, you know, when it comes to regional uh, institution building, Australia always, you know, is always Japan's partner. So these two countries are very important for, for, for Japan in that context. So India is a mixed, uh, I guess, outcome. You know, obviously Japan really dying to have india on our set right that's that's really important i you know at this point they are talking about maybe doing a parallel agreement and this and that but obviously for india having china in this agreement you know all this uh, you know the trade balance between them and therefore other tensions and so on and so forth is really a difficult thing i i see so but but in many ways, Japan really wants India to be on board. And, you know, again, Indo-Pacific, Quad, whatever the ways in which you see this uh, relationship with India, you know, Japan is increasingly becoming increasingly so. While, you know, I have to, I add here though, the relationship between Japan and India is relatively new. And the economic ties is not as strong yet. So, you know, yes, it's increasingly strong, but that's, you know, that's, um, still kind of an ongoing, ongoing process you know beyond this region you know united uk is now becoming japan's good friend you know with brexit especially 
because now UK needs more friends and Japan's kind of, you know, uh, is really a good partner too, especially now that CPTPP is in place, right? So now yeah, UK and Japan is negotiating. And I think they were, they were trying to conclude it by end of August. I don't know if they have, I don't, I didn't, I haven't seen any coverage. So uh, my suspicion is it hasn't concluded yet yet, but UK really wants an FDA with Japan first as a way to step towards CP, you know, kind of joining CPTPP. So there are, you know, quite a few um, lonely fellows, so the, the ones which really needs friends around that, you know, Japan's uh, really be uh, looked at. And especially, again, given the success of CPTPP, I think uh, that was one thing that made Japan, CPTPP, uh, yeah, uh, that, that made Japan uh, really an attractive partner in this, you know, in this area. So we got a number of questions on rulemaking. Ellis, uh, Tetsuro, and others point out that, uh, first of all, the question is, what do you mean by rulemaking? And Ellis thinks that the definition, Japan's definition of rulemaking still is very different from, let's say, a German definition of rulemaking. Uh, and that, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of wet or, you know, informal aspects to this rulemaking. Um, we have an anonymous uh, question on, you know, isn't that all just a fascination of rulemaking? Does, does Japan really have the power to do rulemaking or is this just something that they would like to do, but, but are not really enforcing because China's going to do whatever China wants to do anyway? Yeah, well, yeah, maybe that's a pretty good point. And, you know, since I looked at different issue areas, each, each issue area has different way of rulemaking. You know, obviously, trade and investment is relatively standardized. That you know, if you have an FTA with written rules about, you know, uh, the liberalization with the you know kind of behind the border rules, you know, of various kind, you know, that's clearly a rulemaking and that's being agreed upon and ratified by the government. So I think that's a harder rules. While it's true, like if you look at the infrastructure side, like a development side the rulemaking is much more flimsy and kind of, a, you know, kind of, a, you know, kind of loose in nature. So that rulemaking comes from the fact that it's a cold quality infrastructure where, you know, life cycle of the cost and the kind of debt sustainability, you know, some of that could be considered much looser, but still it's the higher standard of rules that's applied to, you know, kind of agreement across different members. So it's no, it's not just negotiation that each set of agreement or each set of negotiation can change that. Right. So it's it's already kind of you know either through a declaration, either through kind of a agreed, you know, agreed um, you know, agreed documents or whatnot. You know, there is that. But I do, you know, I do agree with the critiques where they say yeah, some of them is you know, still not as kind of a set in stone. So it, it could be somewhat more of an informal rules rather than the formal one. Well, uh, with that, we have one final question that I think is excellent. Colin uh, thinks he wants to read both books and wants to know in which order he should read them to get the... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Colin. Good That's question. question. Uh, I don't know. What does that? What's your take, Eureka? Which which order? Well, I, 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 you you make the point that that the geoeconomic strategy is a reflection of the needs of the domestic needs, obviously, right? So maybe start with the domestic reinvention and then mm -hmm. look at the new regional reality. Uh, that's an excellent question. You get an A, Colin. Uh, so as long as, as long as as long as you can read both, it really doesn't. <laughs> So, um, so thank you everybody. And let me uh, put my PowerPoints back on because there's a question of, could I share the, uh, the screen? And so uh, thank you, Professor Katara. It was uh, great to have had you and I'm sharing the uh, upcoming schedule here. Um, so we'll have uh, business. Uh, first, we'll have literature next week with, the, with John Treat. And he's uh, one of the best and uh, very interesting. He'll get us up to date on what's going on in Japanese literature uh, and uh, also a little bit of a forecast of what to expect. We'll then look at business uh, in late September. We'll turn to uh, the security of East Asia uh, on October 6th and 13th. 
Uh, on October 20th, we'll talk about women. And on October 27th, we'll have Tobias Harris, the author of uh, Shinzo Abe, The Iconoclast, uh, which is already a bestseller, I guess. Uh, it'll be out. It's, it's out any day now. Uh, all of these are, or most of these are already listed on jfit.ucsd.edu Zoominar, where you can register for them. And so join us uh, next week with, uh, with John Treat at 4.30 p.m. on Tuesday, September 15th. And in the meantime, please stay well, stay healthy, and uh, see you soon. Thank you, Professor Cutter. It was great to have you.